is turning the tongue backwards into the cavity of the cranium and turning the eyes inward toward the eyebrow center. The tongue should be exercised and milked and the underneath part cut away in small degrees. Indeed, catchery is perfected when the tongue touches the eyebrow center. With a clean, thin blade, cut away the membrane under the tongue, cut it by a fine hair's breadth each time. Then rub in a mixture of powdered rock salt and turmeric. After seven days, again, cut a hair's breadth. One should continue doing this regularly for six months, and then the membrane at the root of the tongue will be completely severed. Ketri Mudra is also known as Nabal Mudra, and Swami Shivananda has called the practice Lumbika Yoga. There are two forms of Ketri Mudra. The one described here, which involves the gradual cutting of the frenum and the elongation of the tongue, is the Hatha Yoga form, and only those who have detoxified their body and are advised by the guru should attempt it. It is taught from an early age, 12 to 16 years, during the period when the body is still developing. First, the tongue has to be massaged, and this is done by holding it with a piece of cloth and gently stretching it and pulling it from side to side. And the front of linge is very gradually cut with a sharp and sterilized blade. This process draws a little blood, but there is no pain. After this, the wound is wiped in turmeric powder under powdered rock salt so that there can be no infection and healing will be quick. This process of milking, rubbing, and stretching is done every day. Cutting is done on the alternate days or every few days when the tongue becomes elongated. It is not possible to move it by itself into the nasal cavity. For this, for this, the fingers or a thin hooked instrument has to be used. Uh, in order for the tongue to reach the eyebrow center, it takes many years of practice. The Raja Yoga form of Ketri Mudra is much simpler and can be performed by anyone. It is done by turning the tongue back so that the undersurface touches the upper back portion of the soft palate. And the tip of the tongue is inserted into the nasal orifice at the back of the throat if possible. The position should be maintained for as long as comfortable. At first, it will be necessary to release the tongue every now and then, relax it, and resume the mudra. This form of ketri is usually practiced in conjunction with other practices, such as japa, meditation, and ujjayi pranayama, and is used in most of the Kriya Yoga techniques. <clears throat> yeah, that's how I learned it. Having turned the tongue back, the three channels of Ida, Pingala, and Shashimna are controlled. This is ketri mudra, and is called the center of ether. Once the tongue has been sufficiently elongated, it has been inserted into the nasal cavity at the back of the throat. This is not an easy process, and at first it will be necessary to push the tongue into position with the fingers. When the tongue is strengthened, it can be pushed right into the back of the nasal cavity by itself. And when prana is weakened in the body, the tongue will move into that position spontaneously. Yeah, that was my experience. It just happened on its own. I didn't have to stretch or coerce it or whatever they're talking about when the tongue is inserted right up into the nasal cavity the breath can be directed into either nostril by the tip of the tongue Look, the tip of the tongue will be able to block the right or left passage or be placed a little lower so that both nostrils are open <clears throat> to actually elongate the tongue to the extent that it can move up to the eyebrow center will take many years of consistent practice so my understanding was that when it goes back like that it pushes up against a um, marma point that's inside. So I don't know if you really have to get it all the way up there. <laughs> this is the I, first time. No, it's, um, what? This is the first time I'm like very, I have aversion to everything that was read. No, yeah. <laughs> I, and that's why I'm bringing up that you don't have to do that to experience it. Like, when it happened for me, um, I feel like it released some kind of chemical in my brain and everything got very like trippy, like LSD trippy. It was very uh, crazy meditation. Mm -hmm. And it's like if you want to balance, and you know this with acupuncture, right? With TCM, if you want to balance the hormones in the, in, for menstruation and fertility, there are spots you can hit that will release or redirect the prana so that the hormones flow properly. Mm -hmm. with, with this one, it always felt like it was like a, 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 a hallucinogenic button or like a psychedelic button. Like you press it and, then, and I don't know what came first. Like, was it because the hormone cascade that the tongue went up there or or the tongue went up there and then the hormone cascade came, but like the walls looked like they were dripping. It was like crazy, you know, but I feel like there's an acupressure point there and you don't, that's, this is not based on anything. This is like my own experience that I'm speaking to just to like make you less scared. 
it just felt like it was a natural thing that happened and and like it was just like massaging on an active pressure point and then all the other stuff happened it seems like here they're trying to get the tongue like manually all the way up there to like get something you know they, they call it the nectar of the moon comes down like when you massage this point uh what do they call it amrit mm -hmm. amrit they call it in the raja yoga tradition and it's nothing scary and it doesn't hurt and it doesn't feel bad or anything like that i mean like, i think I, the thing that's that's that turned me off about it wasn't if if something like that happens uh after practicing uh naturally uh, you know it, it was all of the tongue massaging and the hooking it with a yeah, hook I, yeah I'm getting a little cutting you now progressively cutting the front of them and that kind of thing it's sort of like it's just so foreign to me it's it's like swallowing the cloth and dredging out your stomach and bringing up uh unnecessary mucus from your stomach or whatever it is it's sort of like okay i'm sure this is great for some cultures, but I am at the other end of the room from that. That's the thing. Yeah, about it. it's yeah. not. It's not. That it, and I and I can see where something like this could happen naturally. Um, although I would imagine it takes a great deal of you. Must, this this must have occurred for you, Amanda, when you were in that space where you were practicing yeah this was the swami zone this was when i was like doing pranayama yeah. constantly and yeah. i was doing asana twice a day and i was meditating twice a day i was doing like all the practices constantly and then that's when it happened but like it happens now um even though i'm not doing as much so i benefit now from you know i could drop into the place of meditation i was in five years or six years ago now um so it, they i've had it explained to me like meditation is like doing um strength work like you go to the gym and you you're strengthening your muscles right but any gains that you get last for this whole lifetime and then future lifetimes so so it's different like your muscles will get weak if you don't weight lift anymore right but with meditation you keep all those gains where you can just drop back into that deeper place you know the ketri can come and it's as far up as the kundalini is rising up the spine that you you keep that um and the cool thing is like you drag that energy body energetic body with you your um pranamaya kosha that like layer of your being into your next lifetime so like i've had students where i teach them meditation and they're like a mess in the beginning right their mind is really really busy it's very uncomfortable to meditate it's not easy because that's the majority of people but i'll occasionally get a student who will like on the first go drop right in like it's no big deal to them they're like instantly in really deep meditation practice and those are the people who what the tradition teaches have been meditating for a very long a lot of lifetimes they've been doing this so that's why it's easy for them like you you keep those gains so anything that that's I, that must have been what she was saying yesterday like anything you can do is great <laughs> it's good it, it stays with you it's not like you lose it or anything so it's worth um, as much as you can in the very busy life that we lead to keep making gains because you, you get to keep them, which is a nice benefit. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry if I'm like going, just tell me to be quiet if I'm going on these diatribes. Oh, are you kidding? This is great. All right, good. Um, all right, look, I just want to read the next section and then I'll let's meditate. Yogi who remains with the tongue going upwards for even half a second is free from toxins, disease, death, old age, etc. One who accomplishes this Ketri Mudra is neither troubled by diseases nor death, lassitude, sleep, hunger, thirst, or unconsciousness. If the tongue can reach the eyebrow center internally, the pineal gland Ajna chakra will be stimulated. There is a close relationship between the pineal gland, the throat center, and another psychic center situated in the upper palate known as Lalana chakra. Vindu Visarga, the psychic center at the top back of the head, is also influenced by Ketri Mudra. Bindu is said to be the place where the moon resides and where when it is full, 
it sheds its nectar or ambrosial fluid down to permeate the entire body. That's the Amrit. Just as the external moon pours its light over the surface of the earth at the time of the full moon, Ketri Mudra exerts a controlling influence upon the network of endocrine glands throughout the body. This is achieved by regulating the production of powerful secretions of the brain itself, which are produced in tiny amounts to control the pituitary gland, and thereby the whole orchestra of glands associated with the centers below Ajna. These dependent glands include the thyroid, mammary, thymus, adrenal, and reproductive glands, as well as many other dependent processes which continually go on in the body. The process of Ketri Mudra also influences the centers in the hypothalamus and brainstem, which control autonomic breathing, heart rate, emotional expression, appetite, and thirst. The hypothalamus is strongly connected with the thalamus and the reticular activating system, which assumes a vital role in sleep-wake mechanisms and all degrees of central nervous system activities, including the ability to concentrate. The practice also influences the salivary gland and the faculty of taste, which in turn are also connected to the lower nerve plexuses involved in the digestive and assimilative processes. Knowing these neuroendocrinal functions of the brain, we can better understand the shloka concerning the powerful effects of Ketri Mudra on human psychophysiology and destiny. That's great. I love this book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just like, you know, so much stuff happens, you don't know why. And this is, she's just like, this is why. <laughs> it's so satisfying. Okay, so that's, yeah. I mean, like, you know, if you think about... Um, is it six cyclobin and um, magic mushrooms and LSD and all this stuff is really just uh, what are they? What's the other one? Uh, ecstasy. It's just waking up parts of your physiology that's already there, right? And like hormones that you already secrete. So we get these sort of um, psychedelic experiences through meditation, I think, because that's another way of stimulating those hormones but not with an external not with an external force it's like the internal ability it makes it sustainable all right i guess we'll do pranamana not alexandra no it is my little chihuahua <laughs> she's 13 <laughs> sorry man <laughs> no it's so I, I didn't have the screen on i actually like went to look when you said she's really cute i didn't know if it was a puppy because i know your other dog just passed right yeah my i i inherit my brother's dogs so i she's mine for 13 years this little chihuahua oh i see and then I inherited my brother's Chihuahua Jack Russell mix. I had him for two years. He was almost 14 okay. and he died suddenly in front of us, which is really bleh. Oh. But I inherited the cutest dog ever. I'll show you her tomorrow. Um, she's only four and she's a little, uh, what do you call it from my other brother? Uh, she's a little Yorkshire Terrier. She's tiny oh, like that. Them. Yeah. But like she's got the bow in her hair and all yeah. the hair. She's really cute. <laughs> I love those dogs. And I feel like she's an evolved animal. Um, I never had an evolved animal. She's really evolved. Like she acts human and with compassion and, and high intelligence. It's really amazing to witness. That's nice. That's really nice. Okay, Amanda, do you want to lead breath? Oh, yeah, sure. Or do you want, or do you want me? Whatever you like. You can do it. Okay, take your right hand and pull the peace fingers into the center of the palm. Close off your right nostril and inhale. Or, yeah, inhale through the left nostril. Then close off both nostrils and exhale through the right. Inhale through the right. Close off both, exhale through the left, inhale through the left, close off both, exhale through the right, inhale through the right, close off both, exhale through the left, inhale through the left, close off both, exhale through the right, inhale through the right, close off both, exhale through the left. We continue like that for a few more cycles of breath.
And then you'll finish out the left side. And we can close our eyes. Place the hands on the knees with the thumb and point your finger touching. And move into your meditation practice.
Bring the hands to prayer. Bowing the head. Namaste. 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 Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.